Hello, eighth grade champions. We are continuing today our book, The Greatest Treasure Hunt in History, The Story of the Monuments Men by Robert M. Edsel. Yesterday, we read um, the opening about uh, Adolf Hitler and his extreme disappointment when he was not accepted into art school. And he felt that that acceptance was in part to the individuals deciding um, if he should attend. And he felt that those judges, if you will, or those individuals, uh, he thought they were Jewish. And that intensified um, uh, hatred uh, in his own mind, a hatred for the Jewish people. And he decided to create a museum, an art museum. He wanted uh, to have the greatest art museum in the world, but he did not want to do this by uh, asking artists to share their art. Mainly this was done through plundering and pillaging and looting and stealing of art uh, from other areas of Europe. So that's kind of where we are. I'm gonna read the last um, two paragraphs on pages uh, one, well, actually in the forward, um, and then we'll continue. Nazi Germany's invasion of the Netherlands, France, and Belgium in May 1940 pried open Western Europe's treasure chest. In contrast to their brazen looting of Eastern Europe, the Nazis wanted to pillage under a veil of legality in the West. So they simply changed the laws of conquered nations to strip Jews of their rights to own private property. This created an avalanche of opportunities for Hitler and his agents, and also for the number two man in the Nazi party, Reichsmarschall Hermann Göring, an art collector with an insatiable appetite. The greatest theft in history was underway. <clears throat> So on June 26, 1939, this on the uh, left is a letter from Hitler directing a person to supervise the construction of the Führer Museum. And it says, I commission Dr. Hans Posse, director of the Dresden Gallery, to build up the new art museum. All party and state services are ordered to assist Dr. Posse in fulfillment, fulfillment of his mission, Adolf Hitler. And so that's just a photograph of the letter that he sent to commission the museum. On November 5th, 1940, Reich Marshal Goring's order concerning distribution of Jewish art treasures. And so he is, <clears throat> <clears throat> giving an order that all of the treasures belonging to the Jewish people um, are to be confiscated. And here's a couple of the paragraphs in, from his letter on November 5th, 1940. Those art objects that are appropriate for turning over to German museums will immediately be inventoried, packed, and transported to Germany with all due care and with the assistance of the Luftwaffe. Those art objects which are appropriate for transfer to French museums and to the French and German art tray will be sold at auction at a date yet to be fixed. And the proceeds will be assigned to the French state for benefit of the French dependents of war casualties. Further seizure of Jewish art property in France will be effected in the heretofore efficient manner in cooperation with the chief of the military administration, Paris. I shall submit the suggestion to the Fuhrer pending whose approval this procedure will remain effective. So when he says he's submitting this to the Fuhrer, he's submitting this to Adolf Hitler. This is Adolf Hitler sketching preliminary concepts for the museum.
Chapter One, Letters Home, Palestrina, Italy, June 1944. So there you have the map of Italy. And the beginning of our story. The army jeep crept along the hillside road leading to Palestrina, a small Italian town about 20 miles east of Rome. Captain Dean Keller, artist, professor, husband, father, and newly assigned monuments man for the U.S. Fifth Army, knew the path from his student days when his painting and drawing talents had earned him the opportunity to study at the American Academy in Rome. No one was shooting at him then, but that was 18 years ago. Recent reports detailing how German troops were using elevation and blind turns as part of their ambush and retreat tactics caused great concern. Determined to serve his country and return home to his wife, Kathy, and their three-year-old son, Dino, Keller and Giuseppe de Gregorio, an officer of the Carbonari, so let, me, let me try that one again, Carabinieri, Carabinieri, and also his driver, continued advancing up the hill cautiously. After rounding a bend in the road, Keller grabbed Giuseppe's arm and told him to stop. He was out of the Jeep before it came to a halt. About 100 feet ahead, lying face down the road, was the body of an American soldier. As Keller approached, he thought of a phrase he had once heard used to describe a corpse. Swedish smell. There was nothing sweet in the air on this hot June day, despite the overpowering and nauseating stench, he continued walking. Those 100 feet felt like a mile. With each step, Keller thought about the boys as he referred to them in his letters to Kathy. They had been fighting their way up the Italian peninsula since landing at Salerno in September, 1943, taking one hill after another. Some were the age of his art students at Yale University. He wasn't sure why he felt such paternal feelings of pride for them. Maybe it was a consequence of being 42 years old. Maybe it was being 5,000 miles away from his own son and able to be the father that he had envisioned. Seeing the young men in uniform, the boys driving the tanks, the infantry soldiers crouching behind them, and this brave warrior lying in the road reminded him of Dino. As he knelt beside the young man's body, Keller noticed something in the overturned helmet. Wedged inside the helmet liner was a small airmail envelope addressed to the soldier's mother. Keller wiggled the envelope out of the webbing. At, as best he could tell, the letter had been hurriedly written, perhaps before or even during battle. All he could do at this point was make sure it was posted. Keller, like all the soldiers he'd met, relished receiving small, relished receiving mail from home. Letters were the sole connective tissue, a lifeline of hope for soldiers separated by time and distance from family and close friends. Even those containing the most dreaded news were preferred to the heartache and gnawing pain of no news at all. Keller recalled a letter he'd received from his mother before beginning his assignment as a monuments man that filled him with pride and emboldened him for the difficult days he knew were ahead. Standing next to the body of this American soldier, caressing a letter to a mother that contained the last earthly thoughts of her son was just such a day. Military service is a big sacrifice for you, he remembered his mother writing but I'm thankful you can see beyond that to realize the great need for good men to help. I believe you will never regret it for your own sake and the sake of Dino. He says proudly now, my daddy's a soldier. I don't know who told him that, but I suppose he saw you in that first uniform. On the long dustville drive back to the headquarters with the dead soldier's letter inside his shirt pocket pressed against his chest, Keller closed his eyes for what seemed like just a few minutes, lost in thought about all that had happened since leaving his teaching position at Yale. 
to get into the fight. This is a picture of Keller, Dean Keller and his son, Dino. Page six, New Haven, Connecticut, May, 1943. In May, 1943, as the end of the semester approached, Keller finally received a reply from the Marine Corps. Rejected, poor eyesight, or so they said. Admittedly, at five feet seven and 170 pounds, with a grayish tint to his hair and the stereotypical wire rim glasses of a professor, he was hardly the strapping figure of youth that so frequently passed through the recruiting office. Then a well-timed letter from a colleague, Tubby Sizer, the former director of the Yale University Art Gallery, mentioned a newly created art projection unit that would comprise soldiers charged with saving rather than destroying. In Keller's mind, that sounded just right. At the end of his letter, Tubby tried to preempt Keller's natural tendency. Don't be so damned modest, he wrote. Put it on thick, Keller did, and it worked. By the time Keller reported to Fort Myer, Virginia for active duty in late September, 1943, circumstances in Italy had changed dramatically. Operation Husky, the successful invasion of Sicily by US, British, and Canadian forces that began on July 10th, resulted in the removal from office of Benito Mussolini, known as <clears throat> Il Duce, the leader of fascist Italy and Adolf Hitler's most important ally. The battlefield then shifted to the Italian mainland, and within days, Italy signed an armistice agreement with the Allies. Hitler was enraged that his former ally had surrendered. He immediately transferred one million German soldiers to Italy to build a series of defensive lines that stretched across the Italian peninsula between Rome and Naples, intended to show the Allied advance and make it as costly, intended to slow the Allied advance and make it as costly and bloody as possible. The war was now going to be fought in a country that contained millions of works of art, monuments and churches, placing some of the greatest masterpieces of Western civilization at risk of being destroyed. It was a recipe for disaster. Following a month of orientation and training at Fort Myer, Captain Dean Keller boarded a Liberty ship bound for North Africa. Like his 550 shipmates, including many young soldiers headed into combat, he felt proud, excited, and scared. On December 2nd, 1943, after more than three weeks at sea, he reached his temporary home, an Army Civil Affairs training school in the remote hillside town of Tisi Ozu, Algeria. The kaleidoscope of fall color of the Virginia countryside was just a memory now. Standing in this desolate Algerian town, all Keller could see were colorless clusters of half-finished buildings and an abundance of braying donkeys and bleeding goats. The sound of a familiar voice over his shoulder caught him by surprise. He turned around, shaking his head in disbelief and smiled. Standing before him was Major Tubby Sizer, the man who had encouraged him to join the new art protection unit and become a monuments man. Sizer had been among the first selected to serve as monuments man. The army had created the civil affairs school where Keller now found himself to educate American and British officers about military government and how to run a town once combat troops moved on. With their training now complete, Sizer, fellow American Captain Norman Newton and British monuments man Captain Teddy Croft Murray were on their way to Naples, Italy. Despite the obvious good intentions of leaders in Washington and the monuments men at Tizi Uzu, everyone questioned whether the mission could succeed. Would allied commanders listen to the recommendations of middle-aged art history professors or architects to direct, to direct artillery fire away from a church or monument when being fired upon? Would Allied troops respect signs the monuments men posted making churches and historical buildings off limits, even if it meant sleeping outside in the rain? And how could just eight monuments men 
in an army of more than 200,000 soldiers protect even a portion of the works of art and monuments in culturally rich Italy. After eight weeks of training, Keller was on his way to Naples to find out. I think we'll stop right there for today. We are on page eight and I'm really excited about this book. I um, must say I never really learned much about the Monuments Men and to think that these men put themselves in harm's way to save art pieces, statues, sculptures, beautiful works of art, uh, churches, buildings. Uh, it's a fascinating story and a true one. So I look forward to reading tomorrow. We will begin um, the last paragraph on page eight. Thank you, eighth graders. Uh, the greatest treasure hunt in history. Sounds like it. Have a really good day. See ya.